Sanjay, I, the audience are waiting with bated breath for news of your EV journey to Scotland. How, how did it go? Was it a fail? So, so I made it back, right? I got there and I made it back. No, it was really good. My anxiety was misplaced. The charging network in the UK was really good. The first experience was my car was charged by the time I had a pit stop and got a coffee. And I was like, I'm still drinking my coffee, but the car was ready. So very, very good. It was just a long drive. So there was, yeah, no tech fail. So I am, yeah, very, very impressed with it. An interesting point there, right? So I was chatting to a tech leader. I can't remember where they were from now, but we were talking about AI and all this stuff. We're going to cover it briefly later. And he said, actually, the, the things that bother me during the day are the same management issues I had 10 years ago. It's about people. It's about So actually, your, your issue was still, it was a long drive. So there we are. It was just a long drive. The kids got fed up. AI is never going to solve that, Sanjay, is it? We'll, we'll see, right? We'll see. <laughs> So listen, I'm, I'm, I'm holidaying. So it's, it's, it's to the audience uh, and, and to those listening, you know, we have to, you know, this is like a jigsaw puzzle bringing together various guests. So I had no option but to record this on my holiday. And I'm, I'm alone in the hills above Alicante with a nine-year-old daughter. And I have to say, it's hard, hard work. I've asked her to go and practice her Roblox for an hour or two while we record this. Um, nice. But what's been going on, nice. your, what's been going on in your yeah. world, uh, Sanjay? So a couple of weeks ago, uh, something that I've been wanting to do for the last couple of months, but a couple of weeks ago, we kicked off our first ever 20% project time. So Google talk about this a lot. You know, they, you know, they call it 20% time. We're not going quite 20% in, in a week. And it's, you know, very much opt in. But I've got a, a, a cohort of the team together. We're working on a project that's completely off the books. So it's a complete skunk project. I don't talk about it in the, in the management meeting. We've thrown away job titles. We're using tech that we don't normally use. I've got volunteers for roles that are not their day job. So I've got a, one of our tech leads is going to be the project manager, which he's kind of gone, wow, there's all this work to do before the next meeting. I was like, yeah, welcome to the world, right? Um, I've got a product manager that's doing DevOps. I don't know why you picked that, but I think he's having fun. We've got a junior engineer that's put their hand up to be a, a tech lead. And I think on the tech side, it's really exciting, like what they're coming up with, like, you know, really breaking down barriers. But for me, it's the social experiment, like the way the team is interacting and the way they've kind of self-organized and how they're helping each other, I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean, essentially they've told me to go away. I don't know if I'm gonna have a job at the end of this, but um, yeah, we're only a couple of weeks in, but very, very exciting. And the very interesting thing is um, when we had our kickoff, we decided to name the, the project, right? And we used AI to name the project and it came up with the best word. We failed and AI, Beaters, right? Well, what's the what's the word? Vera. Vera. So, <laughs> Vera. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to call the project Bob, but yeah, Vera was the word, and and the, the letters mean something, I, and I can't remember, but they mean they mean something based on what the project is. But yeah, Got Chat it. GPT was better than Bob. So yeah, but Vera, well, right. I like the name Vera. No, I like the name too, very traditional old name. But listen, it links slightly. So Stanford have just released um, their 2023 AI index report, which I have to say is a thankless task. I mean, it's 386 pages. I mean, by the time you finish writing it, the, the whole market has moved forward, I would have thought. Anyway, nonetheless, it is quite an interesting read for those of you interested. So some, some of the high, I mean, not enough time to delve into it too much here, but Interestingly, global investment has gone down, which, which suggests that there was a bit of overheating going on in terms of investment into AI. That was quite interesting. AI models rapidly accelerating scientific progress was, was interesting. And I think that whole discussion about benefits versus drawbacks, they also uh, did a bit of research that said that there are certain, so geographically, we have a very different approach to whether we think it's a good or a bad thing. So China, Saudi Arabia, India, I think all of those countries are more than 70% positive about the benefits. In the US, it's very negative. I think it's about only about 35%. So really interesting global differences about how people are looking at AI. But, it, but what I wanted to ask you very briefly was the, the, so the proportion of companies that are adopting AI has kind of plateaued, a bit like the investment, I think. But those that have adopted it are, are allegedly pulling ahead. So there's clear benefits of adopting it according to this survey. I mean, from your perspective, uh, Sanjay, as, a, as an experienced teacher, I mean, how do you how do you absorb this kind of dizzying pace of change? Is it, is it just something that you, 
you have to dip into? Or how are you approaching where AI fits into your role? I think you do have to dip into it. I think as a leader, you've got to find the time, but you've got to make it appropriate. So AI for AI's sake, I'd say is a no-no. And I think that's where some people, some companies, some teams go down a rabbit hole. And, you know, quite often that's, that will cause burn and, and people will get annoyed. However, if you find the right context, now whether it's AI or some other technology that's going through another cycle, but if you find the right context for the business, you know, creating space for your team to go and play with it, right? And and it's probably the two correct words, space and playing, will give you this feedback loop to go, yeah, okay, this is something that we can use. And in our business, we're doing that with with a variety of things. Not AI, because I don't it's not quite appropriate. We can see it coming, but it's not appropriate at the moment. But just playing with some technologies is really important. And and as a as a as a tech leader, just creating the space for your team because they're going to love doing stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's super important. All right, well, listen, producer James has, has flashed up on screen uh, a, a visual of the Stanford report, but it's the Stanford 2023 AI Index report. For those that are interested, 386 pages. You really need to be on the beach or by the pool, I think, to consume that uh, with any kind of comfort. Um, we've got another fabulous guest coming up, Georgie Nightingale, I think, uh, talking about conversations, Sanjay. So that should be good. Um, yes, very excited. But first, of course, the eagerly anticipated next version of. You really, really need to get out more. So here we are again. Welcome to the world's first tech leaders quiz where C2 Academy acknowledge that we all work a little bit too hard. So to encourage our community and our contestants to get out more, we offer a $50 prize to the winner of this unique quiz. Now, episode one, for those of you who have followed all the way through, will know that Steve Van Niekerk in Johannesburg took his family to Luthio's Pizza. Episode two was a complete washout. It was nil quoi. So we had to split the winnings between Bianca in Salzburg and Morgan, who uh, subsequently, by the way, has uh, become a dad. He was on the verge of becoming a dad when we recorded. So that's great. And episode three, hopes are high, but I have decided to go for an all British battle. So we have a British battle of Wales versus England here. So it's a bit of a home, home international, if anybody is old enough to remember those football matches. Welcome, Andy Ryan and uh, Chuck Hardy. Hi, guys. Nice to see Morning, you. Um, and Andy actually hey, is literally is getting out more because he's having a little holiday. So thank you very much for joining us. Andy, just a little bit about you. Give us a, a little bit of background about your role, the company. And what we'd really love to hear is the current challenges that, that you're facing. Yeah. So I'm CTO of a company called Intuity. Uh, we are an online platform that focuses on bringing corporate knowledge to uh, people's fingertips when it's needed. So when writing documents, it uses semantically aware search, uh, AI to bring previous lessons learned, um, safety briefings, guidance documents, say systems of work and things like that, with a particular focus around uh, heavy industry. So construction, uh, utilities, engineering, and things like that. Uh, I joined the company about three years ago. We are um, a relatively small team, uh, still sort of building the engineering team. In terms of challenges that I face, It's very typical startup issues of limited resources and trying to change the world on a shoestring. You know, we've got all these ideas and features that we want to build out and limited time and resources. So a lot of my time is spent thinking about, um, you know, cost benefit analysis and things like that and and which way we should be pursuing on a more personal level. um, Again, sort of typical startup not just wearing sort of a few hats and feel like I'm wearing all the hats. That sort of little bit of dabbling in in project management, um, product management, DevOps, frontline coding, strategy, road plan. It's it's all sort of, it's all there. And it's it's why I joined sort of an early stage startup. It's something that I've always wanted to do. Andy, so a quick question. So we've talked about prioritization before, but the one I want to ask you about is wearing lots of hats. How are you finding it and what, are you, do you have a coping strategy or a strategy to help you context switch? Because I think that's the most difficult thing, right? The context switching. Yeah, I, there's this, I call it cognitive overhead with context switching, right? When I'm going from sort of front line, like head buried in code to um, suddenly having to do a strategy meeting, there's that sort of 10 to 15 minute period um, where I'm having to sort of switch switch from engineering mode to manager mode. And 
I think blocking out time is really important. I, it's something I've started doing quite recently, saying, right, this is an afternoon that I am going to be doing this task, and I will ignore emails, Slack will be muted, apart from direct messages. So it's, it's all about that sort of blocking time and trying to focus. I am someone who gets pulled away quite a lot and, and can procrastinate quite a lot. So having that sort of block has, has really helped me recently. Nice. I, t- I tell you my technique is very boring, but I do a, a job around the house. So I put the washing machine on or I put the clothes outside. It was very, very sad. But I, I think the, the reason I do it is it gives me my brain a chance just to reset. So I go from deep, you know, writing a document or whatever, I reset by putting the washing out on the washing line, and then I can go into the next job. And, and, and I just find that doing something bizarre really, really helps. But yeah, um, not, not everyone's cup of tea. But yeah, that's, that's my technique. <laughs> Well, listen, Sanjay, I'd love you to pop around and have a couple of days a week working at my place. If those are your, if those are the, the tasks you manage to complete in your in your downtime, uh, great. Thanks, Andy. Great to join us. And Chuck, another another scale up journey. I think Chuck, tell us a bit about your your role at the moment. Thank you, and it's lovely to meet you all. I appreciate the time. Uh, so, I joined a company called Sales Room. Uh, it's got sales in the name, which is brilliant. We're building a video conferencing platform specifically designed for sellers and to be more human, to build stronger relationships. And it's just like Zoom meets or Teams, but you can imagine the seller sort of being a pilot of a, a jet aircraft with all of the, uh, everything moving around. It's, it's constantly trying to help them and guide them to do better in the meeting where it matters, which is the moment, not post-call, uh, not pre-call. And then we take all of that data and then we help them be better for the next call. And all in all, help you close deals even faster. And the belief of sales room is, you can't really use the software that you use to speak to your grandparents on the weekend to sign $10 million deals. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And we've had a great journey. Two years, I'm joined as employee number zero, depending on how you like to count your indexes. And it's been a fantastic time since then. Really enjoy it. What's challenges? Doing things in real time, I found, is really tough. Video conferencing is a hard problem to solve, especially with Everyone being anywhere at any time with any internet connection and any type of computer is proving to be difficult. And bringing in a lot of the AI trends and fads that we're seeing right now and putting them in real time so that as I'm talking right now, for example, sales room would be telling me I'm speaking too fast or that I need to calm down or that my, my voice is coming through as not being confident with the words that I'm saying, etc. And consuming that, let alone showing it on screen in real time is really tough. On a people side, I think prioritizing things, as Andy says, Andy's my new favorite buddy, by the way, we're going to be best friends. He doesn't know that yet. But prioritizing things which everyone believes in is really tough. In a startup, if you haven't really got a strong belief in something, it's really hard to execute well. And sales rooms thinking about what life is going to be like for the customers we're going to get five years from now, who are still in university. And so building for them with all the technologies like TikTok and everything that we are becoming more and more used to, you really have to think ahead into the future, which makes prioritization difficult. And the way that we do that was various coping strategies. And I'll steal it from you too. So I live in the middle of nowhere. My neighbors are sheep and cows. And I walk around the garden. We have a very big uh, garden with a river in it. And I get to walk around, put my feet in the river and just think. And I think to borrow from Andy, I had an old boss called Kieran Luke. He was the chief operating officer at General Assembly, which is a global education company. And he said, 40% of your time should be spent thinking, no less. And since then, I've adhered to that strictly, and it's served me well. Uh, and that's it. Oh, and I'm a Leo since I'm expressing everything about me. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. And the, the, awesome. I, 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 sorry, I, I was going to ask. So, so the AI that's giving real-time tips, are you, are you experimenting with different AI platforms? So IBM's, Google's, um, the AWS one, or... Are you kind of sticking to one and then just building on top of it? Great question. The answer is try everything and see what works. So the thing with AI is the closer you get to real time, the thing that suffers is efficacy. So things just get less accurate. And so we have to have a really fine line between the trade-offs that we're willing to play between giving you accurate information, as close as we can, of course, and then giving you custom information. So based on your trends from the past. So, for example, if we just interrupt each other, it might be okay for our relationship, but we have to analyze all the data from our previous calls in order to make a decision. 
And if we're one second late, it's too late, right? Humans are, we don't work like that. So it has to be extremely close to when the activity or action occurs. And that's quite tough. But try everything. Everything that comes out, we're there immediately trying it out to see if it adds any value. And sometimes it's a combination of many. Cool. Thank you. No, thanks for the question. Well, listen, fascinating. But actually, actually, the audience wants us to move on now to the meat of the matter, to the heart of this, which is the Absolutely. quiz itself. Uh, Andy, have you got a nominated local restaurant that, that were you to win is going to be the beneficiary of this fifty dollars? Yeah, there's a great little new steakhouse that's opened in our little town. The high street is dying, but it's, restaurants seem to be doing really well, and this is the the new, newest one. And what's it called? So we can we can flash it up for those that are watching on YouTube. Marbled. Marble. Super. All right. And, and Chuck, is it De- is it Devon that you're? In I am. So my restaurant is Rockfish. It's the one that I love. There's about five of them here in Devon. It's a fresh restaurant. Their slogan is, uh, you know, tomorrow's lunch is still in the sea. And our favorite part or our favorite restaurant itself is in Dartmouth, which is a lovely sort of boating town. Beautiful, beautiful town. All right, guys, no further ado. Sanjay, thank you. I think Good Sanjay's been faded out now by producer James because that, that signifies we are in competition mode. So the rule's very simple. Three questions. First one, he gets two right. We'll take away the $50 of prize money. Because there are people listening rather than watching, we do ask you to say your name if you think you know the answer to the question. Uh, if you get it wrong, it then gets thrown back to the to the other contestant. Are we ready, guys? hope so. Good we luck, are. Andy. Yeah, we've got a so. look of anticipation. Uh, <laughs> Good luck, man. Andy, we've got three questions. Going for one, two, or three? Two. Number two. Uh, they, always, they always select my favourite, which is who am I? All right, here we go. Born 1955 in London, computer scientist. In March na- 1989, he proposed an information management system. But by November, he'd implemented the first successful communication HTTP client and server. Chuck. Is it no. Tim Burden to leave? Number one. Got it. Oh. Exactly right. I, I thought it was, I might have to say the word internet there, but we got there. I felt like I was on nice Jeopardy. Chat. Well done. One nil. I should have said. I know, I know. Absolutely. One nil to Devon. One nil to Chuck. We got one and three, Chuck. Give me a number. Uh, I'll go for one because um, Andy is number one. Number one. Okay, cool. It's, it's, it's a bromance it's a is strong developing one. over the airways <laughs> here. Um, <laughs> Okay, this one's, I think, relatively simple, but I said this in episode two and it went down like a you know, proverbial non-starter. So here we go. What operating system has a mascot called Tux the Penguin? Andy. Unix? Yep. Yeah. No, <laughs> like, I Linux. said Unix. You, you mean Linux, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's take it to a tiebreaker. Let's that's... go. I'm extremely benevolent with this quiz anyway. So 1-1, one, one. there we are. Brilliant. Number three. I think this is an easy one as well, so please shout out your name when you when you think you know the answer. I'm going to take you back to 1976, co-founders of Apple, Steve Jobs and... Wozniak. Sorry, Chuck Wozniak. Yeah. Got that first. Got it. Well then, Thank Chuck. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andy. 2-1 to Devon. Well done, Andy. $50 is going to be spent in Rockfish. It's like the Six Nations all <laughs> over again. Well, I wish I wish we were successful in the Six Nations, but uh, but anyway, fifty dollars is going to go to some some local rockfish. Chuck, please send us a picture. Thank you both very much for joining us. Will do. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. So, so uh, welcome, Georgie, our wonderful guests. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Very good to see you, and thanks for kind being here on holiday as well. No, I'm delighted to uh, to do that and uh, really looking forward to your interview with Sanjay. Sanjay, I think uh, you know the quizzes have been – it's ebb and flowed, hasn't it, the quality of the answers, I would say, in the, in the last three episodes. It was good. They got there, though. They got there. It was amazing. Yeah, really good. Andy and Chuck, thank you so much. But uh, listen, this is a fascinating topic. Uh, I've known uh, what Georgie's been doing around this topic for two or three years, and I've been re- I'm really excited to have her as a guest. So I'm going to leave you guys to take it away, Sanjay. Thank you very much, Andrew. Hey, Georgie. So I am very excited about this. So this is a area that fascinates me, uh, that I have personally struggled with over the last 10, 15 years, and I still try to put lots of work into it. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll dive into kind of what I do for, for one of the areas that I want to 
talk to you about. But I'm just going to dive in. And really, I, I want to give you an, a, a scenario that hopefully you can give me and the people listening some advice on. So as a tech leader, a CTO, a head of engineering, whatever that might be, as they as they progress in their career and they get promoted, at some point, they are going to join a new team. They are either going to get promoted in the same business or they're going to move into another organization and get promoted. And, you know, hopefully that's getting promoted into a, into a leadership position, into a leadership team. Now, once in that team, that's new, that's yours, that's, you know, and you have to build that relationship and build the conversations, not just as a one-off, but hopefully for the next two, three, four, five years. So really, my question is, how? How does someone go about that, building that kind of long-lasting conversations and long-lasting relationships? Yeah, I can imagine this is a scenario that many of us face, not just uh, tech leaders as well, you know, moving to new groups. And classically, there's often a lot of anxiety uh, associated with that, um, that sense of like freshness. Uh, I like the fact that you use the word relationships and also conversations, because I think that a relationship is just a series of conversations, essentially. So rather than seeing of it of I have to manage all my relationships, why not see it as I just get to have meaningful conversations one at a time? Uh, to build the relationship and i think that kind of removes some of the pressure perhaps that people feel when they join new team really you're just getting to know another human being so my encouragement with this is to simply show up as that human remember <laughs> that um everyone else is probably feeling a little bit like what you're feeling perhaps uh, remember that everyone is just as complicated as you are and as rich and as interesting um, it's okay to to be vulnerable it's okay to be warm and friendly um, these are the people you're going to be spending, you know, every day almost with. So why not make it an enjoyable relationship, a rich relationship? I would imagine that, that some of the challenges uh, that your tech leaders will have be not really just knowing how to start, I guess. Um, and uh, I would say in that curiosity for me seems to be like the winning factor every time. You know, you're presented with a new group. I'm sure there's a natural curiosity of like, oh, who are these people? Where have they come from? What are they like? Um, what's their history? Um, how do they get involved in this? You know, all of those things are natural. And actually, by being curious, we um, it's very attractive quality. So other people are more likely as well to want to talk to us because they feel very seen. People like being asked questions. So starting with curiosity, I think, is probably one of the biggest factors here. That's really interesting. Um, so, so actually that's, that's kind of where I wanted to go next. So this is something that I struggle with personally and, and, and I found a tool that I use all the time. Uh, I did it today, um, when I was having a one-to-one -one with someone, um, and it's, you know, what are the tools, um, to, uh, that people can use to build those relationships? And, and what I mean by that is, like what's the opening line so or, or what's the situation to create the environment so you can start building that relationship and building on the you know an ongoing conversation so the one i use um in, in my existing current business is i talk about jujitsu so i train jujitsu love it or i talk about yoga uh, i love it i'm really bad at it uh, which makes it funny and I think com maybe comes back to your point about the vulnerability because I am terrible and I got beat up yesterday. But that's my tool. But it would be really good if maybe you can share a couple of different tools, techniques, scenarios that people can maybe build to give them that opportunity to kind of build those conversations and build those relationships. Because I think that's that, that's a real area of struggle. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, I'll come back to what you were doing in a moment, which is uh, some active self-disclosure. But first, I just want to make a distinction um, between different types of conversations or interactions that might occur. So you're probably going to find yourself already having a lot of conversations by virtue of like, you know, working collaborative, collaboratively, having team meetings, etc. So this is obviously a prime opportunity to talk because it's already happening. But often, rather than jumping straight into the goal-oriented nature of the conversation, you can actually use the beginning at the, at the beginning and the end, and actually I would say also moments in between, to be more relational and more personal. 
And I think this is probably where your tool works perfectly. So when we kickstart meetings, you know, people say, hey, how are you? Fine. They do a terrible script. There's actually a massive opportunity here, which is being lost, which is actually to have some sense of getting to know the other person in that, you know, one minute dialogue. And part of the challenge of the scripts of, you know, hi, how are you, et cetera, is that we're so used to responding in a non-meaningful way that that becomes a normal social script. And I believe that it's everybody's job, but especially leaders' job, is to model the kind of behavior that they're actually looking for. So if you want somebody to actually have any meaningful relationship or interaction with you, you've got to kind of show up first and be meaningful. And that could mean actually offering first an example of what you think is a great meaningful answer. So like sharing how your day has actually been, giving people context of where you are in the world right now or something that's happened this week. So some element of storytelling, maybe there's some vulnerability in that, you know, saying, yeah, this day's been pretty great. But like, you know, these are the things that went wrong or uh, talking about one of your passions. So giving people a chance to get to know who you are outside of your role. So in all these examples, you're giving people hooks or offers, which is another word that comes from um, improv. And the idea is that people can actually then become curious about you because you've given them something, a piece of information that they can then ask you more about. It also gives them permission in that moment to actually reveal things about themselves. So essentially, you're asking them for information without really asking them. You're just using reciprocity here because people will feel inclined to also share something and if they don't you can then say hey well, how about you what have you been up to recently but they're not going to give you that information if you haven't given it to them first to some degree because then people aren't sure of like do they actually want to know so this is why i think the, the one of the biggest things here is the modeling essentially so this is when you're in a, in a meeting setting you know you're using those small micro moments where there's already interaction to build relationships this is one way you can do it the other way you can do it um, is to start interactions when there's not necessarily a requirement for a conversation, but you're just sharing space together. So, for instance, you know, take this as the classic water cooler moment or maybe the coffee machine and the new version of that, I'd say, because we're all addicts, is when you're standing there next to a person is to notice what is in the environment. Notice something about yourself, maybe like, gosh, I'm really craving this coffee right now, feeling really hungry, really excited about whatever things about to happen today. You can also make statements about, um, so it's a statement about the self. You can make statements about the other person. You might notice that they're wearing your like favorite color. Uh, you might want to say that, or they look like they're thinking deeply, um, or they look confused, or they've, you know, they've just got a great uh, smile on whatever that is. It can be a compliment. Noticing that everyone likes to feel like they're being noticed and inviting them to say more about that. Or you can make a statement about the context you're sharing with them. So, you know, it could be what's happening in the day if you're both fans of football, like, you know, like, oh, you can not reference that, for instance. You can also reference the fact that you're like, in front of a coffee machine and it's taking like five minutes just to reload the water and you both absolutely need to get your coffee right now. Otherwise, you'll be hangry and horrible. You know, whatever it is, shared context is a great way to actually invite people to notice what's happening in the shared context. And from that point, you can then follow the conversation and see where it goes from there and follow the tangents which generally means you're probably going to end up in a no more novel place than just asking the same question like, how was the weekend? How are you, et cetera? That, do, do you know what you said? A couple of interesting things. And the, you, you've hit one of my bugbears. So when it's, you know, you ask how, how are you or how is your day? And, and someone says, fine. <laughs> I, I really hate that answer because normally it's not fine. And normally there's a million things going on, you know, Andrew mentioned, you know, his daughter kind of, you know, what, what he's doing with his daughter and stuff like that. There's always something and it's, and it's normally quite personal. And I guess, is, is there a balance? Is there a line or do you have to build that line and move that line? And, you know, I, again, you know, I'm relatively awkward and I don't know how far to go or how bland I should be, you know, should I be talking about the weather? Like, how do you do that? How do you build that? that deep relationship, I guess. Well, conversation is an improvisation. So the only thing we can do is experiment. And I think, you know, we take that approach to the rest of things in life, right? And when in de developing code to some degree, you can play around with different topics. Um, and uh, one of the things I always encourage my clients, is if they feel like something is high stake, is just to start with a 1% shift try one thing that they haven't done differently. You know, if they don't talk about anything, then yeah, okay, maybe start with the weather. If you feel like the weather's pretty comfortable and boring, okay, maybe start with something you've done today. I feel like that's 
pretty edgy. Okay, maybe start with like a recent holiday. Or if you feel like that's not edgy enough, start with a controversial belief or opinion that you've been thinking about. You know, so you can kind of play around essentially. And one thing I discovered through testing, experimenting with these these kinds of openers, um, with both with strangers and with friends, is that the perception of risk was actually a lot more in my mind than it was in reality. And that actually the more the bold more bold I was, the more confident I was people actually really enjoyed it. And it was an invitation for them to also express that side of themselves. The key though, was following through. You know, you can hear it in someone's voice when they're like, they start talking and they just really get through quite like this because they're not really committed to what they want to say. Instead, actually just going, oh, I'm going to say this, I'm going to go for it. And then I'm going to see how it lands. And if it lands terribly, you can make a joke of it. Say, oh, I was trying that one out. (laughs) Clearly I'm not quite there yet. Or it will justify it, saying I was really bored talking about the weather. I thought, why don't we talk about something else today? Yeah. Oh, I like that. I like the testing it and playing around with it and trying different things. That's, that's what we do in our day jobs, right, as, as, as tech people. Uh, at, so I, I really like that. I think that's really good advice. The, one thing I want to go back to um, that you said earlier you use the word permission and and I find that a really interesting word, especially as a leader. And how does that translate? So if is is that essentially if I'm talking about human things and not goal orientated or work related things, is that the trigger to give the other person the permission to do something similar and start being reciprocal about building that that bond it'd be really good to understand because that word just really excites me right yeah it's great that you you brought that out i think is a really important word i think there's permission on on many levels so in one sense it's permission about content that you bring so the kinds of things information that you might share with that person um and to show you know it's okay for us to share things about ourselves that go beyond the code or the task that we need to discuss today. And then the other side of it is permission to just be yourself and to be fully expressive um, in this kind of like, you know, being a human is, we've got quite a lot of range. You know, we're not robots. I know AI is moving us in this direction, right? You know, referencing the conversation earlier today, Um, but we're not robots, we're humans. Humans are multifaceted. They are rich, they are interesting. They have emotions, they have expressions. We need to kind of not forget that essentially. And the more we can show up and embody all the different parts of ourselves as they as they appear, for instance, the more we can encourage other people to also realize and it's okay to bring your whole self. Bring your whole self, you know, doesn't mean that you will like not get shit done. Like getting work done and stuff is, is important. But it means that the way you can show up is is with the parts of yourself, with a bit more vulnerability, with a bit more humanness, with more play you know, fun. It's a really important facet, I think, in our everyday lives. We're not making our work enjoyable and it's not sustainable. And it doesn't also attract other people to want to work with us and be with us. So by showing up and as our full self, we're giving permission to also for other people to realize, you know, they can bring their personality and their character to work. And that is appreciated. And actually in the long run, it makes life more satisfying and we'll probably have a better relationship and therefore our work will probably also be better because of that. So I want to go down a different route right now uh, with our conversation. So I'm going to give you a slightly different, what I find more scary example, right? A scary place that I always end up in. And even even after 15 years, I still get scared when I have to be in these situations. So as a tech leader, we are going to have to go to sales meetings. We are going to have to go to investor meetings, board meetings, partner presentations, I mean, I'm feeling giddy just talking about it, but like, I think if you, as a tech leader, if, if we don't do that, it's very, very career limiting. Um, if we don't do that, you know, we're missing a big chunk of the value that we provide to the organization and the, and the people that we're trying to serve ultimately. When you go to those, those types of environments, you end up meeting a load of new people. So people that you don't even know, have never heard of, don't know their name, can't remember their name. And you might be sitting next to them for dinner or, you know, be thrust into a working group or whatever it may be. Help, right? So how do, how do I start those conversations? Because 
I guess for me, they're very different. Like I'm, I'm very invested in building relationships with my team, right? Um, and I know that's important. And and I really genuinely, and I'm sure are the people listening, are, you know, are willing to put that effort and time in. When it comes to those other scenarios, it's equally important, right? But where <laughs> do I start? And yeah, yeah, what do I do? Conversations outside your team also important for sure. So one of the things that's coming up for me when I'm, I'm hearing you talk about this anxiety is wondering what's happening in your beliefs or in your thoughts that's making it difficult to start interactions because, you know, these are just more humans. <laughs> it's just that maybe the stake is different. One of the things that I notice sometimes when I'm in situations where, where I'm with new people and where it feels important is the part of me that feels like an imposter shows up. And I immediately think, oh, wow, like, oh, I'm, I'm noticing that I feel like I'm not good enough in this situation. That's kind of I'm me talking to myself, seeing, you know, is that true? What is this anxiety about? So I get curious about my anxiety. It might be an imposter syndrome. It might be that I feel like um, this is really important. Like this is a client that we, or an investor, which is really important as well. We need to have on board. So I'm kind of working out, you know, what is, why am I feeling quite intense? And actually I find that that is the first step in making me feel more calm is realizing oh, I have a sense of where this is coming from. The next thing I can do is actually look at those beliefs and challenge them and then say, okay, so I feel like an imposter. Interesting. Cool. Well, this is a pretty normal feeling. This is one I've had before. It, it usually shows up when I'm doing something which falls on the edge of my comfort zone, which is actually where my growth zone is. So I'm okay with having this feeling. You know, it's maybe the same feeling one gets when they do public speaking. Of course, you're going to feel a bit of anxiety, right? There's always, you know, there's a pressure, there's a pressure to perform. Um, and actually that usually creates adrenaline, which means we do a better job to some degree. Uh, so that's one thing I, I would be very conscious of. And then I would also challenge that and say, well, I'm sure there are things that this person does better than me. And I'm sure there are things that I do better than this other person. We, we everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. So actually that is the reality I'm, I'm going to meet here. Um, but I know because of where I am in my career and my work that actually I'm really good at what I do. You wouldn't be in this position unless you were a leader. And so finding that kind of inner resource of realizing that, yeah, actually I've got this, I'm okay. And I don't need this to be, I don't need to be performing at 250%. I just need to show up as my normal confident self and actually realize, you know, I can do this. I run meetings. I've had sales calls before. I've spoken to investors. It hasn't gone miserably and down the drain. And so today it can actually be an opportunity for me to, to try again, essentially. And to also realize that, you know, the other person's probably having a similar experience. <laughs> They're probably also thinking, oh, you know, gosh, I'm anxiety, how do I start this, et cetera. And we, in the end, you know, we're pretty human. The awkwardness is, is a normal a normal human capacity. Um, sometimes when I feel awkward in situations, I actually just name it. <laughs> I say like, oh, I feel like I really want to use this opportunity really well. I'm feeling a bit nervous um, about kind of not knowing where to start. Don't really want to talk about the weather, you know? I think we've, we're probably done with that. So I'll like name that and then I'll, to say, oh, how about, let me, let me, I'd love to find out more about you. Like, you know, what got you into this area of work, for instance, or, you know, what brought you to this event? Or like, you know, I, I appreciate that you're an, uh, an investor or you're, you work in this area, but I imagine that you actually do a lot of other things in your life as well. Like, what are the hobbies are you interested in? Um, you know, how do you spend your weekends? Um, and then if you feel like they aren't likely to, to respond in a meaningful way, you can drop in something about yourself, like, you know, you know, I, in addition to being a tech leader, I'm, I'm also a caffeine addict. Um, I also uh, love to do wild, adventurous things um, in, in my free time, which looks like blah, blah, blah. Um, so you can kind of like essentially test an experiment, drop things in, see how they land. Um, for me, you know, interaction, it's not like we have a big plan ahead. You do something, you notice how it lands, you tweak, you try something else. Um, the key thing is to kind of be creative um, you know, and, and see where it goes essentially. Um, and I find that in these situations, most people are worried about like what kinds of questions or things do I say up front? So that's something that you can actually do beforehand is think about what are interesting questions I could ask this person that are beyond, Hey, how are you? <laughs> or like, what do you do? 
you know, you can actually start to think about like, okay, what is the context of this event? So what, why would they make some assumptions about why they might be there? You know, you seem like this kind of person, you seem interested in X, Y, Z, is that true? I, I really like that, that idea of some prep beforehand. Yeah, I think it's important to, as a balance here in, in a conversation, you don't really want to do too much prep because then you end up not really being in the moment and you have an agenda and you're yeah. going off in the direction, not listening and being attuned to what's happening. So I, I would never completely overthink through something, but it's great to hold lightly some ideas of where you might take an interaction. And I find that mm -hmm. the more you get, more you practice this, and the easier it is to start coming up with, with, with ideas. So the first time, you know, I, I say to people or my clients, like write down five to 10 questions or pieces of information statements yeah. I can start a conversation with, with the awareness that maybe only one of them is great, but you need to write down bad ideas in order to get good ideas. Um, and then just, you know, starting with something. And that you only really try, no, if it's good, is to try it. And then you'll build confidence through trying, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's really, I think the, that there's some useful advice there, right? So just a little bit of prep, but not too much prep is, is, is good. I really like that. I've, I've never done that, but I think that is definitely what I'm going to try next. I really like the environmental stuff as well. I know you mentioned it earlier, but yeah, just kind of, you know, what, you know, why are you here? What's your link? If you're an investor, where did you start? I, I, that seems really interesting because that probably could lead to something quite meaningful, like you said, right? So yeah, thank you. Uh, really, really useful. So I've got one more question <laughs> for you. I felt I'm like so you went sorry, over, George. yeah. One more question. <laughs> Last one. <laughs> Last one. So I like to ask the guest for one bit of advice. So f for our listeners, so something that they can take away, which, you know, for you is key. And, and again, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to frame it a little bit just to kind of give you kind of where, I, you know, where I'm coming from. But essentially, as tech leaders, typically, not always, but typically we're, we're introverts. You know, that's why we're really good at our jobs. You know, uh, the focus, you know, being quite tunnel visioned, you know, th there's a reason why we've gone into those kind of fields. And that does make starting and having conversations really difficult for us right it's really really out of our comfort zone and when we end up having conversations it is goal orientated or very transactional as in i need this bit of information i've got it thank you bye and there's and that's you know end of conversation end of uh, end of transaction so i the question really to you is What's the one bit of advice to break that cycle? You know, so I'm, I'm already in that cycle. I know I am. You, the advice that you've given up so far is, I think is great. But what's the one thing that I should do to practice to break that cycle? Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, so <laughs> fun, funny enough, I, uh, I also would class myself on the more introverted scale, which everyone finds totally hilarious given the nature of my work. Um, but one, so that's why I'm not, I'm not going to peg that. No. <laughs> I, one thing I understand, at least I believe I understand about introverts is that, um, interactions, conversations take effort and energy. And actually there's quite a lot of, a lot happening in our rich inner world. So we don't feel like we need necessarily to interact with people unless the connection is deep. So there's a learning and, and a growth to it. So my encouragement here would be to realize that a conversation does not have to be 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, etc., to be important and meaningful. Literally 30 seconds of something that's more human and meaningful, in addition to the goal oriented transactional conversation, is enough. Micro scale connection does not, it not have to be big. It's the tiny, small things we do often that make the difference. That's really interesting. I've never thought about it like that. And 30 seconds seems less scary than 10 minutes, right? So <laughs> we I like can it. get out. I really like you it. You don't have to do yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Thank you, Georgie. That was really, really interesting. Really, really useful. I've actually written lots of notes while you've been talking and uh, I'm going to take some of it away and, and definitely use it myself. But yeah, I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you. 
Cool. Thank you. It's fun to be here. Well, thanks, guys. Georgie, I, I'm, I'm, like Sanjay, I've literally been writing notes down um, furiously about some of the things you were saying. So really interesting. I love it. There's a couple of things that I could just pick out highlights for me. I think you mentioned about leaders and the model behavior that you're looking for. That is so important. It really is important. We see, I've seen examples of really bad leaders, and, and, and it's, it's like being a parent. It's as simple as that. You know, the behavior that you would like to see others sharing and 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 behaving uh, dealing with in in your organization are going to be modeled a lot on the high level management uh, people and yourself so that was really interesting the other quick thing is the prep beforehand i'm a massive advocate of this it and, and i love your last comment about it, it only needs 30 seconds if you just reference something you know it can seem a bit stalking right but everyone has a social media footprint you can find out what people are interested in and particularly there's crossover with what you're interested in even better but if you just raise something that you've noticed and, and it goes back to you saying george about people like like being seen it's really brilliant i know if someone re references something that i i'm interested in or they've they've researched like it makes such an impact so it doesn't need to be a massive conversation piece it can just be a small little nugget that you've researched and that you like and that you bring up. So I've, I found those two or three things really powerful. So thank you for that. Great. Glad to hear. All right. So, Georgie, thank you so much for all that. Uh, we are about to go off and uh, explore the tech scene in Cape Town. Is that a city either of you are familiar with? We, we had Medellin last time, uh, Georgie, which neither of us had been remotely near. But Cape Town? Yeah. Yeah. I've been a few times. I, I'm, I'm actually hoping to go in May. So fingers crossed. Yeah. Well, so this will be useful for me. Stay tuned, Sanjay, because we're about to uh, introduce Byron Road from Cape Town. Georgie, thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much. Good to speak to you. So I have been very lucky uh, enough to have visited the beautiful South Africa more than once. The most recent visit was just a month ago, as we record this in April 2023, when at Innovation City in Cape Town, I collared our guest today, Byron Road, uh, to come and do, his, to do the 80 seconds. So around the tech world in 80 seconds is going to be focused on Cape Town. Byron, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, yeah, good to be on the show. Now, a wonderful twist, of course, to the globalization, the globalized world that we're in is you're not actually in South Africa at the moment. You're in Armenia. Just give me some backstory as to why you're in Armenia. Yeah, so I have uh, some engineers that work out here and, and my, my girlfriend's company also, they run out of here. So uh, the annual trip to come out and spend some time. Cool. Well, nice to see you. Listen, I'm a huge fan of Cape Town, so I need no convincing about this, but let's go and do our 80 seconds. Uh, Byron Road, are you ready for Around the Tech World in 80 seconds? I am indeed. All right. Producer James is going to start the clock and we will go for it. So, Byron, your role, company, quick details, background. Perfect. CTO, uh, Yebo Fresh is an end-to-end delivery platform servicing the B2B sector in the township retail uh, area of uh, Cape Town and Johannesburg, and obviously further as we get along. Awesome. What's so good about the Cape Town tech scene? Ah, oh, it's very hard to explain. I, I love it. There's just there's a wealth of knowledge, many many good engineers, um, you know, people from various different backgrounds. It's really nice to just network and get together with a lot of people that all have a like minded idea. We call it uh, the Silicon Cape. The Silicon Cape. I like it. Any big players, emerging superstars that we should know about? Yeah, there's there's a lot. I think for me on my side, I'm I'm quite a sporty person. So my friend Amant is is running Pulse, and they're doing a lot of work with live streaming via GoPro, um, and they're headed out of Cape Town. So it's really exciting to see. Lovely. Okay, we met at Innovation City, which is a, which is a great hub. But the local network and support system for you and for the company. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it used to be a lot better many years ago, but there, there's definitely, you know, having having people on the phone that you can give a quick shout out to uh, makes it a lot better. Um, but I do think we need a lot more networking events again. So looking forward to more of that. Okay, well, we'll be down there again shortly. And very few seconds, five words. What makes Cape Town rock? Sea, sand, mountains, and great tech. I love it. Byron Road, thank you for joining us from our It's my pleasure. Anybody, anybody with any, desire, any inkling of going to South Africa should definitely go and uh, and fulfill it and visit Cape Town and Joburg and all the great people down there. Thank you for joining Please us. Please do. My pleasure. Have a good one. Okay, well, there we are. I mean, I've been to Cape Town a couple of times. Georgie has been a few times. It's a wonderful place, a uh, wonderful country. So much potential down there. Sanjay, I know you've been to Joburg as well, haven't you? I, I was in Joburg just before Christmas, and I'm hoping to be in Cape Town in the next kind of six weeks or so, so hopefully end of May. So, yeah, really useful to get a bit of insight there. It's a wonderful place. So just a quick wrap up, um, the, the interview with Georgie, Sanjay, what were your takeaways? Any, any final thoughts on that? 
I mean, I think there was lots and lots of interesting elements there. I think, um, you know, the real big takeaway for me was the micro conversation, you know, so it can be 30 seconds, it can be personal, you can experiment with it. I found those really, really interesting bits of advice. I quite like the prep, you know, I, I, you know, I go to, you know, conferences with third parties quite often and I don't prep. So I, I really like that. And just practicing, you know, I, I just loved it. Like there was lots of commonality in, in some of the anxiety in those different scenarios and just practicing uh, and, you know, building that muscle. I, I really like that. So yeah, some really great advice that I'll be I'll be using for sure. Yeah, no, I loved it. And I think, I think there were many, many quotes I could take from it, but another one was the perception of risk is often in your own mind, you know, and, and, and she mentioned you're sitting yeah. next to someone who's probably having exactly the same palpitations about what do I say to this person? So, you know, just be natural and just, and just relax into that conversation. And micro conversations is a great takeaway. If this topic uh, resonates with you, if you think it's something you'd like to find out more about, if you like Georgie's style, uh, then she has her own platform called Trigger Conversations. We'll put a link on the podcast information. But Georgie Nightingale, Trigger Conversations, and I really recommend if it's an area that you feel that you need to improve, then do have a look at that. Thank you all very much for listening, for watching if you're on YouTube. We will have episode four coming out shortly where we're looking at persuasion, another really important topic that comes up a lot in some of our live sessions. So thank you again. Me, my CTO and I was a CTO Academy production with special thanks to Sanjay Mystery, Georgie Nightingale, Andy Ryan, Chuck Hardy, Byron Road, and you, our audience, from the hills north of Alicante, hasta la próxima vez. Thank you.